guests for our second day of dialogue event. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Joanna Laslor Montes, and I'm the graduate assistant for civic literacy and on campus events for Hofstra Center for Civic Engagement. To share a little bit about the Center for Civic Engagement, we organize dozens of on campus events, including forums, conferences, debates, workshops, exhibitions, cultural gatherings, and performances around several important themes, including nonviolence, social justice, sustainability, the democrat democratic process, and globalization. Much like today's event titled Analysis of the Biden Budget and the Social and Environmental Safety, we are excited for you to engage in the conversation. Today's event is crucial to understand because it highlights America's post-pandemic recovery and how we stand in the world. We are very delighted to have this event moderated by Dr. Caroline Eisenberg, if you want to give a away, <laughs> um, a Hofstra professor of U.S. history and American foreign policy, who's published multiple articles on issues of war and policy issues. Joining us today, we also have Dr. Robert Gutman, if you want to give a wave, <laughs> um, a Hofstra professor of economics who has widely published in monetary theory, money, and banking. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Eisenberg to start today's event and capture what Day of Dialogue is really about. Can, can this go up? Let me see if my mic works. It does. Okay, it's great. Hi, everybody. Um, you know, I was thinking that sometimes there are different periods in the life of our country, and sometimes it seems like there's so much happening, so many things to keep track of that are really important that it kind of overwhelms all of us. And I was thinking about that in advance of Robbie's presentation today because I suspect, most certainly for myself, I suspect for many people here, in the audience, the, the whole question of the pandemic and COVID has had a way of eclipsing a lot of other matters. And so it's very easy to not notice that there are debates going on right now in Washington um, about domestic issues and our economy that have enormous implications um, for all of us going, going forward. Um, but you can easily lose track of it. So I'm actually really happy um, to have uh, Professor Gutman here, who's going to talk about some of the debates and issues about our domestic economy. Um, Robbie was um, educated in Vienna and then got his PhD in England. Um, and as previously mentioned, among the topics that he teaches um, international economics and public finance. He also has won the distinguished professorship, I think three times, which might be a record. It's 1989, 2008, and 2012. Um, on each of these occasions, he was selected as the um, outstanding professor. Um, he's also published widely, as was just mentioned earlier, um, articles as well as books. Um, just mentioning um, the, the book Eco-Capitalism, Carbon, Money, Climate Finance, and Sustainable Development, and then another book that's coming out in December, um, most recent one is Multipolar Capitalism, um, the Era of the, the End, the, I'm sorry, uh, the End of the Dollar Standard. Um, one of the things I just want to say before I introduce, let's turn this over to Robbie, is apart from all these qualifications, and there's a lot more that we're not hearing about, um, as his colleague for many years here at Hofstra, I think what's terrific about him is the ability to take very complex subjects that are very daunting for the rest of us and actually talk about them in a relevant, 
um, an important way. Um, so I was actually delighted that he was convinced to do this presentation today because I think all of us can really learn from it. And after he finishes, we're going to open the floor and hopefully people won't be shy about expressing confusions or questions that you might have, et cetera. But it's really a great privilege to have Robbie Gutman here today to talk about um, our domestic safety net and climate change and the legislative questions before us. So Robbie. Thank you. What an introduction. So now that the expectations were raised, uh, I hope not to disappoint you. Can you hear me, first of all? Good, very good. Uh, so I'm trying to make sense to what's going on uh, right now, which is a bit messy, but that's often what the price of democracy is all about. Messy in the sense that uh, the subject that I'm supposed to talk about today is not even clear yet in the sense that the, uh, the negotiations within the Democratic Party between different factions uh, have taken on longer and are more complicated uh, and they're not going to conclude until probably this weekend, right? So I'm talking about things that I'm not even sure are going to be in this uh, bill, right? <laughs> but uh, the best way to approach this is to give you a, so, sort of a broader context, right? And the broader context has to do with what is known as the Build Back Better agenda that Biden proposed early on, uh, and uh, one, one, one with. And uh, it's a three-pronged strategy, meaning there's three different components to it. Uh, initially, and here I also have to go through some names for you, uh, and names can be confusing, so I hope to be as clear as possible. Initially, they were called uh, American Rescue Plan. That was the first prong. The Americans' Jobs, Jobs Plan, that was the second prong. And the American Families Plan. Right? So the ARP, AJP, and AFP. Uh, don't test anybody on this. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's already not. forgotten. Right. Um. But... Well, you know, there's, there's something to be said for those names. Uh, they're plans, right? <laughs> and they're radical plans, uh, given, you know, the, the context. Uh, they're, they, they're together would amount to probably the, 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 the largest and most transformative package of policies since the New Deal, the 1930s. So this, is a, this would be a hugely uh, transformative uh, program, if, if passed. Uh, and then I'll talk to you a bit more about where we are with the passage of that pro program, right? But the first thing to remember is that there's three different stools, three different legs, right? And they make sense in the sense uh, that the first one, the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, which did get passed in March, almost completely in, in accordance with the original proposal, they are here to basically get the U.S. Uh, society, the U.S. economy, out of the pandemic and into a, rec into a sustainable recovery. Right? And so the, the provisions of the ARP uh, are really meant to stabilize an economy uh, that was in a, in a lot of turmoil, right? And still is in a lot of turmoil because of the pandemic. You have to think of the pandemic as probably, you know, uh, a once in a century event uh, that is both uh, a huge shock to the economy from the supply side as well as the demand side, right? We all locked down, you remember that, right? But so this is like an earthquake you know, for an economy. And, uh, and there's a lot of damage, there's a lot of scars, there's a lot of shifts, there's a lot of uh, exposure of weaknesses that we ignored before. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of reorganization and, uh, and you need to get out of the pandemic to kind of stabilize that situation, right? And to get out of, the, out of the pandemic, you have to have vaccines and you have to have a vaccination campaign and you have to rebuild a pretty much uh, stressed out public health care system, right? And so a lot, of, a lot of the provisions of the American Rescue Plan were that. But they also meant to support to provide income support for, for both businesses as well as households whose uh, income gaining activity had been disrupted, if not altogether destroyed. So there was a lot of money being injected into the economy for people to have you know, a, a, 
some, some, some spending capacity and for businesses to basically have enough cash flow uh, given to them by the government in order to kind of survive uh, this, this crisis. Right? What was important in the ARP uh, is, was a lasting policy, uh, we will see whether it's lasting, but an important policy change in terms of a, a child tax credit. Right? and uh, which was provisionally funded for a certain short period of time. Uh, but what's important about the child tax credit is that it's a universal program. All universal programs are important, right? Because they have basically broad support and they apply to everybody. It's not means tested. And so everybody, everybody who has a child can get that. And you can get that even if you don't pay taxes high enough to, to qualify for that tax credit. It is paid out as a subsidy. It is paid out in cash every month, $300 per child. It depends on the age of the child, so it changes after, after, you, after, after a certain age. But, but so that's a, that's a new program, and it's a kind of a safety program to, to, for families with children. A lot of this has to do with, with, with the difficulties of raising children in America. And we can talk about that later, right? Uh, and the government, compared to other countries, provides very little support. Right? So I, I also worked in France for 29 years, and, and, and my son is in France right now, and he lives there, and he wants to come back to the US, but his French wife says, no way! If you have children here, they automatically go after 18 months to a crash and kind of a pre-K thing, uh, and the government supports it. The government there spends about $20,000 per year on, 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 on children, yeah? and here we spend about $500 a year. And the difference shows. So that's the beginning of a process here, right, in terms of families with children. So the ARP passed, passed right away, passed in terms of a budget reconciliation procedure, which you will hear lots about when you listen to the news. But that's a special, a special parliamentary procedure that allows uh, in the Senate for 50 votes to basically pass legislation related to budgets. Right? And the reason why that's important is because typically you have in the Senate uh, now for some years a very strange process where a, a, a minority of 40 votes can basically block any legislation. That's called the filibuster. And, and uh, starting with Obama, the Republicans basically locked in an automatic filibuster for everything. And, and therefore, there's nothing passing. There's no legislation passing in the US, right? Other than when the Republicans say, we will not apply the filibuster to this. But you need to pass budgets, so you have a, an exception for the filibuster that relates to budgets, right? And that's called the reconciliation procedure. And that allows the Democrats to pack in various policies, including this Build Back Better agenda that I'm talking about, and pass it through a budget. But they have to pass muster with the Senate parliamentarian who decides you know, what goes in there, right? What relates to the budget sufficiently to qualify for, the for, the, for that procedure. Right? And that's a pretty complicated question which we can get and return to. But I'm just sort of throwing it out there for you. Uh, so what, in terms of the other two prongs, the other two prongs, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan, are not stabilization policies. It's very important that you understand that, that when the government intervenes in the economy through economic policy, which is typically a matter of spending and taxes, it can do this either as a, on a short-term basis for short, shorter terms effects that are, we call stabilization policy, right? where you basically have to adjust the level of spending in the economy to come close to full employment. Right? And, and, and the American Rescue Plan was clearly mostly that. Right? But the other two prongs, the, the, the American f Families and Jobs Plans, they are what we consider growth policy. They're longer-term policies. And they are meant to affect the growth capacity of the economy. So they, rather than dealing with the demand side and the aggregate level of spending in the economy, they are meant to basically build up resources and, and, and build up productivity levels and thereby increase the growth capacity of the economy. Right? And they're sort of a longer term policies. They're longer, they have a longer term orientation. They work mostly on the supply side of the economy. Right? We have not had 
growth policy in any organized way for a very, very long time. That also needs to be said, right? So one of the reasons why there's a certain urgency to this policy is that we have not had ambitious economic policy other than the, uh, the Affordable Care Act on a growth level for a very long time, right? basically since Reagan. And, and when you don't have growth policy for 30, 40 years, then you're going to end up uh, with certain, uh, certain declines, certain erosions. Right? The, most, the most tangible that you can see is the state of our roads. Right? Uh, we, I mean, and, and we, I mean, we're losing a huge amount of uh, time and money and GDP, if you will, by having very bad roads and, and, and very shaky bridges that slow down traffic. Right? And America is a super car, is a car culture. It depends on cars, and the, our cars are moving very slowly. And so, rebuilding the roads, rebuilding the bridges, will 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 free in its by itself. By reducing traffic jams, it will, re you know, it will, it will, it will uh, reduce time lost, and that could be used for, you know, more productive purposes, right? But if you don't do anything about this for 30 or 40 years, basically it falls into a state of disrespair, this uh, and, and, and decline. So, uh, so at the heart of of the of the American Jobs Plan is basically an infrastructure program, and. He, he, he ended up doing this in a bipartisan way. In other words, negotiate a package with uh, 10 willing Republicans. Ultimately, 19 Republicans out of the 50 Republicans in the Senate voted for it. It's half the size that he wanted. He wanted initially 2 billion, uh, sorry, 2 trillion, 2 trillion is 2,000 billion. It's 2 million millions, right? Uh, he wanted to have two trillions over eight years. He got one trillion over ten years. And uh, but but the 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 major purpose was was preserved in the sense that you had you have you know different spending packages for different elements of the infrastructure. So there's of course there's roads and bridges, but there's also uh, electricity grids. And remarkably, Republicans, those, those 10 that negotiated, accepted to have uh, provisions within the electricity grid that actually make it, uh, that, that, that basically work in, in, in favor of climate change. You need to have a specific type of electricity grid changes to accommodate solar power and wind power. And the Republicans, for the first time ever, basically accepted that as a, as, a, as, a as a necessity. Until now, the Republicans have been completely opposed to anything about climate. Right? You have to know that, too. And, uh, and so he got that. He also got an infrastructure for, for charging stations for electric vehicles. It's also an important part of the climate policy. That's also in that package. Uh, not as much as he wanted, but, uh, but you know, more than half have that. Uh, there's going to be, uh, as part of the infrastructure, also the redoing of, wa of our water systems, which are in terrible shape, <clears throat> as well as some investments in trains and uh, more generally public transport, right? Uh, the U.S. used to be a leader in railways, but now is one is far behind other countries, right? Other countries are building all over the world, actually, super fast trains, right? Uh, so, you know, when I lived in France, I would go and work sometimes in a place that was 300 miles away and I was going to be there in two hours. And my son, too. My son lives in Paris and works in Reims, which is basically going from, from, from New York to, to, to uh, Baltimore. Right? But he does this every day as a commute, like me going to, from, from the city to, to Hofstra. It's that fast. But they're also extremely energy efficient. Trains are very, very good in terms of the future of transportation, right? We need to kind of think of energy efficiency, and they're very energy efficient. So we're going to do something about trains. So there are elements of, of a pretty broadly defined notion of infrastructure, right? And, uh, and, but, but what happened is that, the, that this package got tied to the other package. And this has to do with internal democratic politics, right? So you basically have to think of the Democratic Party as being two different parties under one roof. 
And uh, it used to be dominantly the centrists, if you will, that kind of shaped policy. And Obama was a centrist, and Clinton was a centrist. But increasingly, you have also a pro so-called progressive wing, which is a more, uh, more inclined to use government for all kinds of, uh, of ways, and also is concerned about equality, is concerned clearly about the environment. So the progressives have their own agenda, <clears throat> and they've gained strength. And, uh, and they're strong enough now to basically challenge the, the previously dominant wing of the Democratic Party, right? So now you have two different wings that are kind of, they have to argue it out. And, uh, and so we have a very curious political kind of scenery right now. Uh, and this is part of you know, a global trend after the, after the first crisis, the 2008-9 crisis, basically the political, the political landscape in many countries splintered into many different play parties. Right? So the, the previous long-standing uh, arrangements of parties and coalitions and, and, and governance were all shaken up. And, in, in, and, and this is true in some weir, very weird way also in the US, but the US is not a multi-party system, right? The US it has, has a built-in infrastructure of politics that makes it a two-party system. But one party got captured by Trump, and still is captured by Trump, and that makes it a very different party than the traditional Republican Party. And the other party split into kind of two, uh, where the, the previously more marginal wing of the left became much stronger and now is challenging the centrists in strength, right? So you, have, you basically have a two-party system where one party is taking a break, if you will, and has different agendas. We, will talk, we can talk about the Trump agenda or the Trumpists agenda. And then you have this divided Democratic Party, right? And so as they go on, the divisions crystallize around this third prong of, of the Reagan agenda, right? which is, has different names. Right? Uh, we often, when you look at the media and listen to it, you, you, you can, it's, it's, you, you're forgiven to get confused by the differences in names. Right? This could be called the budget reconciliation bill because it is going through a budget reconciliation process. It is the only way the Democrats can pass this. But in order to pass this through the budget reconciliation, they need all 50 senators to vote for it. And so every single senator can hold the whole thing up. Right? And, so that, and so you have two senators in particular, uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia and Kristen Sinema from Arizona, who for their own particular reasons that I can hopefully explain to you if you're curious, have their own agendas. And so they are, it's not like the Democrats are split 50-50, the Democrats are not split. They're basically, there's, there has been a long-standing negotiation of the two wings to come up with a package. But there are these two senators and a few, few holdouts also in the House, which are not nearly as powerful and as influential as those two senators, that are holding this up and they're negotiating. And then first, one of the, I mean, so what, what do we know about the negotiations here, right? One negotiation, and that has been the obsession of the, of the media, and therefore it's kind of really not doing service to the drama of the policy content, is, is how, how large should this be, right? So the progressives had this idea of six trillion, then they, they, they nailed it down to three and a half trillion. And Manchin insists that it's not going to be more than one and a half trillion. So it's going to be less than half of what the progressives wanted. Right? And that means there have to be some choices. You can't have everything. And one of the complications of the different groups within the party and the different strategies and the different negotiation tactics and priorities, right, is that there is a, there is, there is a choice to be made on a very fundamental level, okay, between having a few ideas and having them well-funded and having them put in place for the long term so that when the Republicans ever come back, they cannot touch it. You put, a play, you put in place a new policy, and I'll talk about the policies in a minute, but you can put in place a policy and you fund it, and then it sits there. And the Republicans would have to go explicitly kill it. And that's a politically very difficult thing to do. 
especially if it's a po popular policy. Or, or that's the alternative, is you, you, th you now throw in as many ideas as you can, as many policy proposals as you can. You fund them very you know, little because you only have a one and a half or two trillion dollars to play around with. But you put them in there like the foot in the door, and then you hope that the public gets used to them, the public gets uh, excited about them, the public wants them, and then it becomes politically too costly for the Republicans to ever get it down, to ever get rid of it. So we don't know, I mean, obviously, obviously, to me, as I follow this, there's going to be a mix of both, okay? There's going to be a mix of both. There's going to be some central ideas in there that are going to be in there and they're going to be funded and they're going to be, they're going to be viable for a while. And then there's going to be a whole rush to get all kinds of things in there on top. We'll find out. We'll find out in the next few days. I think, because there's reasons why they have to get this done, and there's reasons why they have to get it done within a week. Right. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting moment in that sense. right? So what are we talking about here? So you have to think of this as a social infrastructure thing. So when we're talking about the infrastructure before, it was a physical infrastructure, like roads and bridges and pipes and electricity grids and train tracks. But part of the idea of Biden is, or the, or the Democrats, is to, that the infrastructure is more than that. There's a whole care economy. There's a whole, there's a whole social infrastructure, which is schools and housing, affordable housing, and, 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 and health care, and, 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 and so forth. Okay? And so that's where, where we're going with this. So you have, you have, first of all, you have family support. And by family support, we're talking about several things. We're talking about making permanent the child care tax credit, but also subsidizing child care and elder care. Lots of families are sandwiched between having young kids and taking care of their parents. Yeah, that's extremely stressful, but a lot of American families are there. But the whole idea of child care and, and, and elder care and, 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 and provi providing support for that is also to deal with one element of the, of the pandemic, which became clear in the pandemic, which was what happened to women, younger women in the labor force, dropping out of the labor force because of the child care crisis. Right? There's about 4 million women that dropped out of the labor force that are not able to come back yet. Because there is, it's extremely difficult and expensive right now to find it adequate child care, right? So, so the, the labor market participation rates of women in the working age population has, has dropped dramatically, and, 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 and it's very difficult for women to come back. So there's a real acute problem there that needs to be addressed, right? But the, the other thing that is very much related to that is to actually have a provision for paid leave, paid family leave. America is the only country in the, I mean, the, I shouldn't say that, right? So we have 192 countries in the world, and we have 181 countries that provide paid leave. So even poor countries provide paid leave, right? Uh, we have 133 countries that provide paid leave for more than 12 weeks. We have one country that has no paid leave, and that's the US. You, have, you can have paid leave, like Hofstra professors have paid leave, but that's part of a deal between Hofstra and the professors, right? We have a strong union here, and that's a good thing, right? But there's no, there's no, there's no provision to have generalized paid leave, right? And that's, that's often a real problem for many American families. There's many good reasons why you want to be on paid leave. So that's one thing that's in there, right? That's also, that would be a, a permanent policy change, and, and it's, 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 it's kind of obvious that it's necessary, right? So there's this family support arm. Then you have an education part. And the education part crystallizes around universal pre-K, which is, has been proven to be an extremely good investment. When kids get into the school pipeline early, they're, they're much better prepared subsequently to go through this uh, process. Uh, and, and so we have that provision. We also had a provision of uh, two years of com community college for free. We have, we have investments in, in, in 
historically black community, co uh, black colleges and universities. We have Pell Grants being expanded. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of things for education. But the key one here is the universal pre-K. Then you have, thirdly, healthcare. In healthcare, this is complicated, but, but one of the things that's important is to widen, to widen Medicare coverage for older people uh, over 65 to include vision, hearing, and dental work. And being old myself, I can tell you that's pretty useful. You know, uh, luckily, again, I'm still at Hofstra. I still have Hofstra health insurance. We have, we have vision, we have dental. Uh, my hearing is still pretty good, even though I listen to music loudly all the time. Uh, so, uh, but that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, and is to, ex to, to basically complete a process of, 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 of Obamacare by expanding Medicaid to all the states that have refused to expand Medicaid. So the federal government would take over Medicaid expansion in resistant states, which is an important part of the Obamacare coverage expansion. And then, then, then the, 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 another one that's crucial is to allow Medicare, which is a big organization covering the senior citizens' health insurance needs, to allow Medicare to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for group rates for drugs. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but American, Americans pay 2.7 2 times more for drugs than the European Union. And it's pretty clear knowing how this works, okay, because I live in both places, that essentially, essentially the Americans subsidize the healthcare systems of other countries, you know, uh, where, 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 where pharmaceutical drugs are price controlled. You know, the French government puts a price control on, on pharmaceutical drugs. And the pharmaceutical companies, whether it's you know, French pharmaceutical companies like Sanofi or an American pharmaceutical companies like LexoClient Smith, they're all global, they have global drug supplies, and they're basically charging Americans a lot to be able to survive these uh, ceilings on their drug prices, right? So when I'm, in, when I'm looking at drug prices and I'm taking a bunch of drugs and I'm in France and I'm here, I can see the price differences right away every time I go to pharmacy. It's like shocking. Right. It's like shocking. I have to have an inhaler because I have COPD because I was stupid enough to smoke for 47 years. And, uh, and so the inhaler there is a fraction of what I pay here, even with my health insurance here. Right. So, uh, so that's health. So we've talked about family support. We've talked about ed ed education. We've talked about, about health. There's some housing provisions. We can talk about that if you want to, but the crucial part, and this is what I'm trying to conclude my talk with, is for climate change, right? So many of the climate change provisions, a key one I'll explain to you in a second, that used to be in the original infrastructure provision, the physical infrastructure, was, they were, that was rejected by the Republicans, so he took it and put it into this plan, right? Which is known as the Clean Energy Performance Program which is a carrot and stick approach of penalties and subsidies, or rewards, I should say, to force power, power companies to go uh, out of fossil fuels into renewables on, in, on, within a 10-year span. It's totally essential to American climate policy. And uh, so that's, in, that's the key provision. There's also tax breaks for, 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 for various types of uh, new uh, technologies we shall need and electric vehicles we shall need to get to the to get to through this transition to zero carbon uh, and 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 so there's a carbon plan there right that's in, inside that package right uh, and uh, and then all of this gets paid with tax taxes on well to do as well as on corporations right this whole package, one and a half, one point seventy-five, or two trillion, whatever it's going to end up, will pay, will be paid for by taxing uh, a, variety, a variety of tax streams that are very much being debated right now. Right, there's like uh, proposals every day and the rejections every day, and it's kind of chaotic. But we have we know that there are certain things that are going to be in there for 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 for, for tax revenues. Right? So uh, that's, that's the program. Let me just 
make a concluding comment, and then you know perhaps maybe that's a provocative enough to encourage. I really want you to ask me questions, right? So you have I see this in a much broader and deeper historic context, right? Uh, I have sort of I have this I wrote these three books on capitalism. The last one is coming out in in, in, a, in, a, week, in a couple of weeks. I mean, actually, early December, I should say. And my, my, the idea, and I've had this idea since I was 19. It's a story that I tell you, but I met, I met somebody that had a huge influence on me subsequently when I was a sophomore student. Uh, it's, the idea is that the, the capitalism goes through its long waves. I and mean, we know it has short-term cycles, but it has also long waves. And it goes through these 20, 30 year periods of fast growth and then 20, period, 20 25, 30 year periods of slow growth. And, at, 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 and in that slow growth periods, you have, you have various types of crises. And you get out of these crises through policy reforms. So you have, you know, if you, if you can kind of vaguely familiarize yourself with this idea, uh, the New Deal, you have the Great Depression, you have the New Deal, and then you have the international extension of the New Deal right after the war with the, the Bretton Woods system. And then you have a stagflation crisis in the 70s, and we get out of this with Reaganomics and the Reagan Revolution. And to me, to me what, we, what we have gone through since 2007 is very much in that same uh, context, right? Uh, we have a period of slow growth, we have a period of crises, and they are followed by reforms. And to me, this, this reform, as well as reforms elsewhere, in other countries that are going on right now, there's a lot of stuff going on across the world, especially in climate policy, uh, is, 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 is a way out to establish a new, a new phase of capitalism. And, and the, the organizing principle around that new phase is the so-called zero carbon transition. Which is, a trend, which is basically a technological and industrial and social political revolution that we need to be able to achieve in order to make our planet uh, sustainably livable for the next generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, was, <laughs> that was wonderfully clear. Um, so we want to open the floor to questions or even comments. Melconian. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie, for a very clear and thoughtful presentation. You've learned a lot, right? But one comment that I have has to do with the very notion of the so called trillion dollar budget. when we look at the military budget, which is going to be about $750 billion this year, perhaps even higher than that. Yeah. Perhaps higher than that, yes. We don't talk about 10 years. No. Because if we talk about 10 years, we talk about an $8 trillion military budget. Yes. But when it comes to social spending, well, we, they're hoping to get $1.5 trillion for 10 years. Yes. Ten years. Yes. That's the key point. Yes. That the way in which this is framed is not really, I think, correctly framed. We're really saying, as a society, we prefer excessive military spending to the social needs of this society. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. You Robbie, can I sneak in here and just, right. yeah, just pile on to his comment? Or really, it's a question um, a, that having to do with the fact that this $3.5 trillion or $1.5 trillion is a 10-year plan. Yes. Um, so it's much less for this year or the next year. But my just on top of what Marty's saying, it does seem to me that the Biden administration has done that to some degree, that they were talk they've been talking about a $3.5 trillion deal, which has contributed... I think to people's misunderstanding about what is really being spent on any given 
time. So I'm just sort of wondering if you would yes. include that. I'm sorry. Yes. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> there's a short answer and there's a longer answer. The short answer is you're right. You're <laughs> right. Both of you are right. Uh, the longer answer is that it's very, uh, it, it's, it's very sad in a way, uh, and it's very dangerous uh, to have this implicit bias, right? Uh, the implicit bias being that this is how the media does represent uh, and present the, 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 the debates, the discussions, the plans, the policy proposals, and what it focuses on, right? So let's be clear about this, right? Uh, we have a military budget that's huge. The U.S. spends about 765, 770 billion dollars uh, right now in the current budget. We will have a new budget, so it'll be a bit more than that. It will take at least another two or three percent up, uh, and that's per year. Uh, and that's uh, that's by the way, that's more more than the next nine countries combined. The U.S. spends more on the military than all the, the, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth country combined, including China, including Russia, and, and so forth, right? So we have a huge amount of military spending. And you have to understand that, that uh, that's, that's a way in which we have built a national consensus to basically have the government operate a communist economy because the government is a monopsonistic buyer and it basically has a process of giving contracts to firms uh, that it basically wants to support as an industrial policy, right? And, and we accept this because this is in the national security interest, right? And so we have a relationship where we have contracts with very profitable margins built in at very high prices of a monopsonistic buyer to a monopolistic supplier. It's not like there's a competitive bidding process going on. There's some, but it's, it's relatively limited, right? So this is a kind of an industrial policy engine. You also have, as part of the military spending, you have an organization within the Pentagon called ARPA that basically funds new technologies. The internet came out of ARPA. You know? It used to be called ARPANET. Uh, and so we have that part. You also have to think of the military as, as regional development policy. You know, the government basically looks at certain regions and puts a lot of military installations there. You have to look at this as an employment policy for three and a half million people. Uh, so you, 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 we, we, have used, we have used the military industrial complex in a very organized and bipartisan and nationally consensual way to basically install the government into the economy in, in a way that we, you would not want to kind of like accept if you look at it sort of as, as, as social policy, right? On the other hand, we've had a long-standing policy, or, or, or kind of, uh, how should I put this, where you have the Republicans in the offense, the Democrats in the defense, where the Republicans basically are denuding the government and they're kind of stripping it down and they want to minimize it. And, and there, there's a whole lobbying process going on, right? where what policies are possible, what policies are not possible. And that's, a, that's, a, the other, that's the other side of what the government is doing in a kind of a social context, which is where the Biden agenda of building back better tries to catch up some, because we have basically for 40 years ignored and starved this part of the economy. Right? Now, one, one reason why we can kind of, we could hope perhaps to mobilize a better vision, a better discussion, a better understanding, uh, and go beyond these crazy political divisions is to basically understand two things and try to get a consensus about this. One is that we have very little time to avoid utter catastrophe in terms of climate change. But 45% of Americans still don't believe that climate change is a problem. Right? I can tell you that it's a problem because I've traveled to many places that I used to see 40 years ago, right? And uh, <laughs> they're not the same places anymore. I used to ski on glaciers, the glaciers are gone. Why should you care about skiing on glaciers? Well, understand that glaciers feed rivers. Every river comes from glaciers. If you have no glaciers, you have no rivers. If you have no rivers, you have no cities. 
built on rivers. I grew up in Vienna. That's a river city. So that. I also used to live in, I mean, my first wife had a house in Belize, so I would go to Belize. There's the Key Corker. There's the second largest coral reef in the world. I took my kids 25 years later back to do some scuba diving there, and the corals are 60% dead. But what does that mean? Why would you care for that? You would care for that because corals are at the essence of the food chains in the, mar in the, in the ocean that feed fish. Fish depend on that. We're already overfishing. Without corals and overfishing combined, you're going to have no fish. If you have no fish, you have to understand that not only are one and a half billion people eating fish every day because that's the best and cheapest staple, but you also have hundreds of millions of people living on coasts in fishing villages. They're going to have to smuggle people displaced by climate change rather than with their boats rather than go fishing. Right? So you have some pretty fundamental changes already underway now when the temperature has only gone up 1.1% uh, 1.1 cel degrees Celsius. Right? At the current state, we're going to between somewhere between 2.7 and 3.6. Uh, that is a recipe for making half of the world uninhabitable. Besides and beyond raising sea levels to the point where Hofstra may not exist in 100 years because the Long Island could be flooded. It's a pretty low-lying area. Right? Uh, so we, 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 have, we have a very small window of opportunity to get this under control. Right? Uh, I don't know whether you know anything about greenhouse gas emissions and how they operate in the atmosphere and what the current stock level is and how much we're growing it and what the projections are. It's nightmarish. I'm going to be very glad to be dead, but I'm also very sorrowful and I have much discussions with my kids whether it's worth having kids. And by the way, one way to deal with climate change is not to have kids. Uh, but that's not a very good solution. Yes. Hello, hello, professor. Awesome yes. speech. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you can expand upon a little bit the two senators, the one from West Virginia and the one in Arizona that are kind of holding up all those packages or stimuluses. I was wondering if you can expand upon that a little bit. Can I sneak into your question? I'm using my microphone to sneak into everybody's question. Um, but Ravi, when you talk about that, um, could you also say something about the Republicans? There's not a single Republican that's really, that is in favor of this bill. Yes. Every single Republican has said they will oppose it in the House and in the Senate. So as you talk about those two Democrats, I think, could you also help us to understand the Republican? There's also another question. The definition of nationalism in America is normally military-based, but why can't we have the same idea with like social programs? I'm a, I'm a sociology major and also a history major, so like I have like the combination of the two. But our mindset is more on the forces of our military than the people who we see every day who are struggling. And you go to around and you see people homeless everywhere, and then you're like, well, maybe if they, you know, just you know, got on their bootstraps and they would walk and get a job, which is not exactly possible when you don't have programs to help these people get on their feet. Right. Well, yes. So let's be let's be disciplined about these questions. So about the yeah. So I'll take them as they come. Right. Uh, so the two senators. I mean, of course, a lot of attention is is. Is, is on them because they, they are basically holding up the whole thing. But the other side of that equation is that it's remarkable how unified the Democrats have been, right? that only two senators are opposing this. Right? Uh, so it's been, under, it's been actually, to me, very interesting to see the Democrats getting their act together to a major degree more than I've seen them do in the past by being unified around this program. Right? But there are these two senators. And I think there's more than two senators. It's just that there are other senators and other members of the House that are not speaking out as much, and they may have concerns, and they may not be as dramatic uh, attention-seeking characters as those two, because one of the things that are clear is both cinema and mansion like the spotlight. 
But Manchin is in a very unique position in the sense that he is a senator in West Virginia. West Virginia is not only one of the reddest, one of the most Republican states in the country, uh, where Trump won by what, by 40 points or something, uh, but, but it's also a coal state and then a gas state. And, and, and I mean, basically, the, the, this program that I was talking to you about, this clean, uh, this clean uh, electricity performance program, would basically phase out coal-fired plants and, and, and oil-fired plants and gas-fired plants. And so, in some ways, I think that Manchin, who's traditionally a fairly conservative uh, Democrat and has a long history politically, uh, but is a, is a really a, a kind of a very powerful senator from, from way back, right? Uh, he, he, he ha he's, you know, he's in, the, he's in the Energy Committee in the Senate, and, and he, has his, he has his backers and his, his, his funders. Uh, he has lobbying interests that he represents, and he, he's, he's basically doing what he's paid to do, basically, right? Uh, but he also does that because he, he likes to make sure that he's continuing to be the only the single Democrat elected in a very red state, right? So he, he very much, he doesn't care about the Democrats in that sense. He cares a lot more about his particular relationship to the West Virginians and to the lobbying interests that, that are basically his donors. Cinema is more of a, more of a mis mystery. Uh, I read a very good article about her in the second to last issue in The New Yorker. Uh, very psychological profile, I have to say. But uh, she definitely, one thing that's quite clear is that she, she is very much uh, getting a lot of money from donors. And some of the donors, the biggest donors are pharmaceutical companies. And so she's been opposed to this provision, which everybody in America, I mean, there's like an 85% approval rating for that, which is to have to be able to negotiate prescription drug prices down. Uh, she's opposed to that, and she's opposed to, but it's not clear where, I mean, she's pretty mystifying, right? Uh, it's, and a lot of this has to do with her relationship to McCain and her, I mean, there's a lot of people also, I know this from my own kind of uh, history when I see my friends that used to be very radical leftists, which she was, and then they're becoming much more conservative as they get older. Uh, maybe that's part of it too. Talking about the Republicans, well, that's a bit of a sad story. Um, so the Republicans have two huge issues, three huge issues. Uh, and all three converge to, it's best to, to do nothing at this point, right? One is they, they, have, they have very little policy ideas, you know? If you, it's really complicated to find Republican leaders that have a policy program that addresses some of the issues that we're facing in this country, like, like health care, or, I mean, it was most dramatically clear when, when they were repealing, they wanted to repeal Obamacare and then uh, one of their own asked, well, what are you going to do about it? What are, what's replacing this? That was McCain, right? And then they said, well, you know, health savings accounts. <laughs> health savings accounts are not exact. They're not, not necessarily a bad idea, but they're not going to be, they're not going to make a fundamental transformation in terms of insurance reform that Obamacare was, right? It, it, it's not a replacement. And so they have a dearth of ideas and policy ideas. They're not like what what they used to be when they were under Reagan, right? Reagan had a lot of, uh, the Reagan people had a lot of ideas. Uh, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that they're, they're dominated by a wing of the party that's, uh, that has, has a different interest, right? Uh, I, I don't know exactly how to explain that interest, but it is a, a, a classically fascist wing of the party, right? And uh, I'm saying this being myself, you know, the son of Holocaust survivors and having looked at fascism for quite some time. Uh, and we can talk about what we mean by fascism, right? But it certainly has to do with, with leadership and it has to do with uh, nationalism and it has to do with a uh, particular reorganization of society. Uh, and and, and, and the, all of these qualities would apply to that group, right? And the group is going to be there with or without Trump. And I think they're going to be more interesting and more dangerous when they're, once they're done with Trump, if they have different leaders. 
And they have to go through that process. They have to get rid of the Trump trauma and the Trump shadow. Uh, and they're themselves be, 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 beholden to that trauma as much as we are, but in a different way, right? And the third thing is just pure power politics, right? The only way the, only way the Republicans can hope to get back into power, because they're, they're demographically and structurally a minority party, right? They need to be able to, to, to not give Democrats any reason to vote. Because Democrats vote very sporadically, right? And, and so they voted, of course, they voted to get uh, Trump out of the White House. But it's not clear that the Democrats are very disciplined about getting vote, get, going out and voting, especially younger people, right? And so if the, the, if the Democrats are not succe successful in passing legislation, then there's going to be a lot of disaffected people in the Democratic Party, and they're not going to vote, and the Republicans come back to power. And they're, they're changing also the rules of the game to make it easier for them to come back to power, right? There's all these different reforms, that uh, voter restriction laws that they're passing. So in terms of the third question, the, the military and the social, uh, I'm not sure why you, why you started that question with nationalism, but uh, because to me that has a different ring. But in terms of domestic policy agendas, I think that it's exactly this effort by the Democrats to de-emphasize military and move towards social policy priorities around, around education, health care, family support, and, and housing including also climate policy, right? And that's, that's, that, that agenda of the Biden agenda, the Build Back Better agenda, that agenda is going to be with us for a long time. That's not an agenda that's going to just die, right, uh, in, in whatever gets passed here. Uh, that's, a policy, that's a policy vision that is relevant and, and defensible and, and useful beyond, beyond the presidency of, of Biden. Right. And that's, that's a necessary reorientation of priorities. Uh, Costas, before I go to you, I'm going to go to Leandra. Um, so I read a little bit about um, the negative effects of, you know, the kind of imperialist, capitalistic mindset that's behind a lot of businesses in American culture and kind of um, how, you know, they overlook either safety risks or environmental risks to, you know, make a profit. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ford Pinto example from like the 60s. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. So I guess my question is, do you think that in combination with that mindset and um, the individualistic nature of our, you know, American culture, if that's necessarily the reason why people are so resistant to climate change or completely in denial that it's even a factor or if there's just a combination of a bunch of little reasons? Maybe restate the question a little bit. I don't know if people could hear in the back. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm wondering if you could restate the question. Yes, right. The, the question is about, about given, given our corporate, corporate mindset, uh, bottom line, profit, short term, uh, whether, and given, given that that is part of our mainstream culture, uh, whether that's the key problem uh, why we have uh, in America such a unique resistance to climate change. Is that a fair, is that a fair representation of what you were saying? Yeah, just like saying that um, because of, I guess, the nature of our country and that, you know, capitalistic mindset, if people are so resistant to climate change because it's really not profitable to do things in favor of the future of our planet, if you think about it like that. Right, but that's a very, that's, I mean, hmm. Actually, that's a pretty complicated question, right? If I wanted to be honest about it, right? It's to me, it's quite clear that that part of I mean, there's several problems here, right? One is that you have to kind of you have to do costs now in order to have rewards later, right? And 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 this requires political leadership also among among just businesses and business leaders, right? And I would not be. I would not generalize. I would not generalize everybody to be equally bad about this, right? Uh, and I think that we are going through a process, uh, and it's a fascinating process to me, because it's it's a process that deals with finance and the financial interests and investor interests that are that are trying to impose a longer term vision and an, an, a better evaluation of climate related risks 
and and uh, and 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 try to figure out how to deal with writing off stranded assets that are going to be in the trillions in terms of oil reserves and so forth, and how to finance new technologies that we need for the transition. There's a process going on, right? There's a process going on. And the process, we are in the middle of this process. However, it's a slow process, and we don't have much time. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's a global problem. It requires global leadership, global governance. And we're building that. That's the Paris Agreement. That's why we have this meeting in Glasgow, right? But in this, in this, in this setting, in this setting, you have all the countries in the world involved, but you have two big players, China and the U.S., and they're both, for their own specific reasons, have real issues being leaders in that. They're not. And, and part of the problem is not only that they need to be leaders and they need to transform their economies more profoundly in a way than, let's say, the European economies, which are already much more environmentally solid. The Europeans are, third, the Europeans are five to ten years ahead of us. Right? But you also need to transfer a lot of resources to the developing countries, which have contributed the least to climate change emissions, but are getting to suffer the most. So we have to... So, so there's, and it's kind of like you have to explain to Americans, listen, this is a global problem, right? Like the pandemic is a global problem. You need to have vaccines everywhere. You need to have, you need to have a transition towards a more sustainable economic model everywhere. And that's, the Americans, the biggest problem to me is not that they're kind of capitalist, this and capitalist, that. They are, they are very short term and they are very, very uh, provincial. You know? Americans don't, the Americans don't think globally very well, right? Uh, other than in an entitlement sense, as, either as tourists or as, as having open markets, right? But not as a community. And I think that's a real problem culturally. Right? Cost us. By the way, that's the chair of the economics department. Right, so uh, you can see that we have interesting coffee discussions at the yes. department. Yes, and he's very different than me <laughs> politically. <laughs> No, uh, I was going to say, Robbie, that my problem with Biden's plan, and not just Biden's plan, but pretty much any plan that the government puts out, yes. is that they often implement policies that cancel each other out. And so we end up like incurring the cost with having very little effect. So to give an example, the Obama administration was subsidizing, for example, installation of solar panels right. uh, to bring the so cost of solar panels down and make it more affordable to consumers, which I personally applaud. Uh, but at the same time, they were taxing the Chinese solar panels, which Horrible had the mistake. effect of bringing the price back up. So you have yes. two policies canceling yes. each other out. So with respect to the Biden plan, on one hand, we're concerned about the environment and, and, and climate change. But on the other hand, uh, spending a lot of money on roads and infrastructure is a subsidy to people who are driving cars and yes. contributing to climate change and people who are not particularly poor, by the way, people who drive mostly are, you know, higher income uh, it's people. A, it's a car culture. Uh, right. Uh, so, so these are two conflicting policies. Secondly, from the revenue side, is that how do we pay for this? We talk about tax on corporations, which as economists, we know that this actually taxes end up being paid by consumers, workers, shareholders, and so on. Uh, um, but there's no mention of a carbon tax. And no mention of a gasoline tax, which I think is more fair. If you want to have better roads, then the people who drive should actually, like Reagan implemented the national highway tax, because the idea, I think, correct, was those people who use roads should pay for it through uh, tax on, on gasoline. Um, so again, you have conflicting policies there. Uh, in terms of schooling and investing in, in the skills of, of, of people, I, I'm very much behind the universal pre-K but then there's no reform on public schools and performance there. Right. Uh, you talked about lack of ideas by Republicans. One thing that I think Republicans, my, in my opinion, are on the right side is uh, 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 vouchers and, and school choice in general. Most mm -hmm. people in polls support that. Yes. Uh, African Americans in particular for obvious reasons because they're the ones more likely to send their kids to failing public schools. But then the Democratic Party you know, opposes that. Yes. Uh, and uh, also, you know, talking about uh, the uh, dropping of, of women from the labor force. On one hand, 
we want to encourage them to go back, and I think it's good, right, then the, uh, allowing them, subsidizing pre-K would help them do that, but then the paid leave and money that we give to people for time spent not working has the opposite effect, which is uh, giving them a reason to stay at home. If, if you can take time off and, and, and receive income um, for not working, obviously that means that you have um, a greater incentive to stay at home. So I, I see these things as, as being in, you know, contradicting with each other. And, and my concern is the more ambitious the plan gets and the more the things we try to achieve, the more likely we are to engage in this. So I, I, in my opinion, I think it would be better if we just focus, what is the priority right now? If it's the environment, let it be the environment. Uh, if it's investing in, in, in uh, education, let's, let's do that. Rather than try to do too many things, spending a lot of money and then having those things cancel each other out. Right. Uh, so I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on yes. that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, very, very good comments. Uh, look, I think that, that, that the, the Democrats have a once-in-a-generation chance to pass something before they lose the majorities again. And that's why they're packaging everything into this, right? Of course, now they have this problem that they need to get all votes, every single Democrat to vote for it, and they have, they're, they're suffering from that, right? But they, 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 you know, in the best of worlds, you have very smart people running the country and, and thinking hard and going out there and getting input and defining the priorities and looking for bipartisan compromises and passing thing after thing after thing and trying to be coherent with each other on the policy side, right? That's in the best of all worlds. We're like, we're like, we're like, we're like stone age away from that, right? Uh, we are like in a completely different set. We, we're, in a, we're in a civil war, right? Where the majority is losing, right? And so the majority has this one chance and it packs everything in there, right? Now, that's one thing. The other thing is, so you're bringing these examples of policies that are not, co not only not necessarily coherently coordinated, but that they're countervailing to each other, yes. And the solar stuff is absolute, that was like, There were a few things I was very upset about in the Obama years, and that was one of them. <laughs> that made no sense. Right? But you can see the, in, the, the intensity of lobbying interests as well, and it's also our, our increasingly stupid evaluation of China. Undifferentiated evaluations, if you will, right? Uh, we, we don't understand China very well, and we don't understand how to relate to it, and we are kind of like prone to make a lot of mistakes. Right? Uh, but in terms of the other examples that you give, I'm not so clear about, right? For example, we are a car culture, but we're gonna have electric vehicles. And in the absence of public transport, you're forcing people to have cars, right? And public transport here is outrageously expensive because it's controlled in a, both the fair, the fair price contracting uh, as well as the way construction labor is organized in this country is, 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 is and the corruption that goes with all of that is pretty weird, right? It's, it needs to get destroyed, right? So, it, you know, I mean, I don't understand why a mile of subway in Paris costs one-sixth of what it costs in New York City. I, I understand it, right? But when you add it all up, it's like, we'll never have trains, right? Uh, the one thing that I, I, I mentioned, that you mentioned that is absolutely crucial, but you have to tell people about it, you have to talk to people about it. Without a carbon tax, we are going nowhere. And countries have carbon taxes. Sweden has a carbon tax of 137 euros for, per ton of, uh, green, of, of CO2 equivalents. That's, a, that's incredible, right? And that, that country is doing really well. Precisely because it has this incentive structure to move very rapidly to a different accumulation regime, right? To the point where, where Volvo, Volvo's factories get completely remodeled into, into, into like a group technology thing and with much more, much more energy efficient than before with the assembly lines, right? Uh, so, so countries can adjust to these, to these signals, but, but when you look at, at different countries with carbon taxes, they also re reimburse people. They just need the carbon tax for price signal, right? And without that, we're going nowhere. To me, to me, right? The, 
the, the biggest economy in the world, which is the second largest per capita emitter of carbon taxes, is falling way behind other countries in the next phase of capitalism. That I'm talking about us. And it's because we're politically not able to do what's needed. And we're, we, we're also like, we're not talking to people about it. You know how much, how much intensely interesting discussions you have in the public's mind in a place like Brazil? or Tunisia. These are places that I happen to know very well. Uh, we don't have anything like that. And so we're, we're, self, we're committing ourselves to falling behind, right? But the problem is that you need to have these price signals, right? And you need to understand, the Republicans need to understand that it has to be done by price signals rather than regulation. There will be a moment, five to 10 years from now, when our ass is burning, literally. And then we'll have an issue. Then, you, then, then everything explodes, right? Uh, and we, we, we let it come to that point because we're not able to, to, to deal with this. Even, you know, even the current plan is ridiculous to me, right? It has only carrots, no sticks. Right? It has no signals, no price signals, right? Uh, so I don't know whether you agree with that, right? But yes, yeah, sorry. It's in there and it is. Yes. Oh, we have three questions. Thank you, Professor Goffman. That was very informative. I just had a quick question about the um, louder, um, louder okay. about the civil war that you announced. And um, a month ago, Biden administration they actually announced the partnership between UK and Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, sharing the technology, you know, the nuclear submarine, you know, technology with them. And um, a little bit after that, Australia said that in this um, climate, you know, conference, they're not actually uh, committed to the, you know, whatever they promised in a previous, you know, conference. And they're gonna have actually zero carbon by 2050, which is too late, you know, for- You're talking about Australia? Yeah. Yes. So I just wanna say that if, even if these, you know, um, policies that are you know, proposing by Biden. But we look at the global like, you know, impact and also saying that we're gonna defend Taiwan if you know, China gonna like, you know, attack um, Taiwan. So what's going on with this world? You know, does it matter that who we have as a president in the US also, the, you know, this policy seems the same, no matter if it's like you know, Trump administration or Biden administration, there's no much changes, you know. And we need a global change to fight the climate, you know, climate change and global warming. It seems that you know we don't have that. So, people can't hear Right. Well, we're talking about, if I may rephrase the question, right? Uh, the, the 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 question is about whether it really is a matter of uh, sufficient political difference between Biden and and Republicans looking at what happened lately or recently with our secu new security arrangements with Britain and Australia and nuclear submarines, uh, and then Australia also reneging on its previous commitments and pledges. Uh, you have to understand Australia is a huge export, is the largest exporter of coal in the world. Uh, and, uh, and whether it makes a difference, is that, is that a reasonably good sum? Right. I still think it makes a difference. I'm not sh I, mean, I wish I was more sure about it, right? Uh, I, I, I mean, to me, Trump was exceptional, right? So I'm not sure that I would generalize the Republican Party as, as being symptomatically as, as out, out there as Trump was, right? If there's a difference between Biden and Trump, uh, I think that quite honestly, uh, the way I see this is that, that Biden has his hands full. He has a lot of stuff on his plate. He's, he took over the presidency in an incredibly fraught and complicated moment. Uh, and, and so he doesn't want to raise more issues than he has capable cap capacities of handling. So on the questions of trade, A, and our relationship with China and rethinking our relationship with China, he doesn't want to go anywhere away from where Trump was because the public has been programmed on those questions quite a lot, not only by Trump, but even before. 
the left is also, his progressive wing is also a bit shaky on the question of China as well as on the question of trade. So you'd have to also have some internal tensions. And he doesn't want to go there. So by default, he doesn't do anything except, you know, ramp up kind of a national consensus around, which, by the way, the Chinese do the same thing. They're, they're demonizing us and they're saying it makes absolutely no difference whether it's Biden or Trump, right? Uh, so there's that kind of dialogue of non-dialogues, uh, of, 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 of using, using, the ten, using the other and the demonization of the other to kind of group around some kind of weird consensus that ultimately doesn't exist. Uh, it will ultimately, I mean, the world will depend on, on whether China and the US can step beyond Glasgow, beyond meeting next week, which is not going to lead anything to, within the next two or three years, to have a much deeper commitment to climate change as the driving engine of a, of a, of a, of a, of a technological industrial revolution. And that requires, they, 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 they have to do this ever since. Ever, look, this problem has been there since the 19, early 90s, right? And in 1997, we had a chance in the Kyoto meeting, right? And, 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 and the US wanted China and India to be there and commit themselves. And they said, no, you, you, you commit yourself first. And we're still in the same, you know, we're still in the same kind of uh, who blinks first and why don't, we, why don't you do it and I don't do it later and I'm not like you and, and I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But, but in the end, both sides will understand that there are substantial domestic, even from the narrowest perspective, they need to have a, a climate deal and uh, they need to have a global, a global system of uh, carbon tax, they need to have a global system of carbon border adjustment uh, tariffs. I mean, you have to have a global approach to this. Right? And we're not there yet, because we still think it's, the problem is, is not as urgent as, 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 and we still don't understand that it's actually already happening. We still think it's a problem out there in the future. But it will take really good leaders to do this. I think there was a question back there and then answer it. Um, well, first, thank you very much for the for the speech. Very interesting and clear. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions, if I may. The first is um, me being from from Europe. I'm more um, more used to the policies there with the Ozone Recovery Pack we have there, called the Next Generation. Which, if I'm not yes. very uh, confused, is about also two trillion and. In Europe, the way they are facing it is um, Europe distributing the funds to every country. Yes. Uh, well, not Poland and Hungary, but to almost every country, and then letting them decide uh, with an approved plan how they are going to use those funds, either um, government spending and also being able to uh, lend out more money in approved plans for companies, uh, as you said, also very much aligned with climate change and education and so on. And my question is, how is it the plan here in the United States with the Build Back Better plan? Is it going to be more federal, more state applied, or how are they going to manage those funds? And my second uh, question is, um, what are your thoughts or are you concerned of this build back better um, huge spending. Uh, how will it um, also um, be provoking the inflation uh, concerns around the world and maybe somebody, some people saying the inflation spiral and how are you, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Good questions. Uh, I need to be disciplined about not giving answers that are too long but still makes sense. Look, first of all, yes, the, so the Europeans have this next generation, um, among other climate policies, they have this, this fund, which is basically a fund for, for the transition to zero carbon economy. And it's true that they're, they're looking at countries coming forth with their plans, and then they disperse the plans, uh, the money for those plans, right? And, and, and of course, everybody's very excited about it. It's, 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 it's like having a Green New Deal, right? And, uh, and it's going pretty well. I mean, you mentioned Hungary and Poland, but that's, that's, 
they're going to get their money too, right? It's not like they're going to... I mean, there are negotiations because they, they have political regimes right now that the, European, the majority of European Union member countries are disapproving of, right? And, uh, but it's pretty... It's hard to imagine that they're not going to come up with some kind of compromise, right? Now, one thing that's really fascinating, and I only got wind of that last night, is that because, because Manchin managed to kill the most important element of the climate plan of Biden, and Biden has to go to Glasgow, and it ha he has to, I mean, this is an incredibly important moment, right? Because Glasgow, COP26, was programmed in the Paris Agreement of 2015 to be that moment where, where countries make much stronger commitments, right? And, and, and the US has been remiss for, forever, right? The US has, I mean, to the point where, where, where Trump took the US out of, out of the Paris framework, right? Uh, within the first week of his presidency. And, and but at that point, we were the only country in the world that was not part of it, right? Now we got back in, but he, Biden has to show up and he has to present something. So right now they're negotiating something which is very much like the next generation EU where they're going to have $300 billion and they're going to give it to the states in response to plans. So it may very well be that something like the next generation EU plan is going to actually be done by, between the federal government and state governments uh, on a much smaller scale initially, right? Uh, that's, I, I just heard that last night, right? Uh, and so I'm not even sure whether that was just a friend of mine getting excited or, or a friend of mine who has good information, right? Usually he has very good information. He's close to the, the progressives in the Democratic Party in, based in New York City. Uh, the, what was your other question? Sorry. The inflation. The inflation, yes, very important, very important. Right? So we have, we have inflation uh, more than we've had since the uh, 80s. There's a moment. Uh, but there's three issues about this, OK? The first is that we don't know to what extent this is an inflation that's related to uh, the pandemic and to, to a particular constellation where you have pumped up a lot of demand and there's a lot of pent up demand by people that have not spent money for two years normally, but they have money in their pockets. And then you have this unbelievable, you know, like, a roller coaster of supply disruptions that accumulatively, accumulatively feeding on each other, and then you have also labor market disruptions, right? So you have, uh, we, we, and we, we have no clue how this is going to unfold. We have no clue all about all the interactions because we've never in our entire lives lived through this. This may play itself, work itself out over the next 18 months, right? There are, but, but the key thing is whether you have people thinking about inflation, whether inflation expectations are taking root in their heads and among investors and financial investors. That's beginning to happen, and that's a problem. But two things. Remember the point we made before. The three and a half trillion or two trillion or one and a half trillion, it's, a, it's over 10 years. So it's like you have to divide it by 10. When you divide it by 10, let's say it's going to be two trillion, right? Then it's 200 billion. If it's 200 billion, that's like 1% of GDP. That's not a lot, okay? It sounds huge, but it's not. It's, a small, it's a relatively modest, this program still, right? Because it's over 10 years. And it's also, it's a growth policy. It works on the supply side. So it may, if it works th and without all those intertwining mutual cancellations, uh, then it will increase the growth capacity of the country. It will have productivity gains built in. And that may, be un that may douse inflation, right? It's not like you're just pumping money into the economy. You're, you're investing in the economy in certain strategic spots where you've had a longstanding history of underinvestment. And when you have underinvestment, then any investment has a pretty big jump of return. Right? Talk so I'm not that worried about inflation. I think we're being told that we're coming to the end. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? Before you adjourn, I just want to say a special thanks to Robbie Gutman for really an incredibly Just incredibly illuminating discussion, and also to the audience. I think we've had absolutely great questions yes. and comments, and um, hopefully these conversations will continue beyond today. So thank you for everybody. Yes. Thank you, everyone.